Sure. So I think one of the most common misconceptions about breast cancer or cancer of any form is that people think that it can't happen to them. Uh, I certainly thought that. I mean, I, I went for just a routine mammogram, not thinking there would be anything wrong at all. And then, you know, the next day I get the call and then everything really spiraled from there. But the reality with breast cancer is that one out of eight women in America will get it. And so for, you know, the kids in the classroom right now, if you count off the girls by eight, that's, you know, statistically where you are. And then everybody else in the class knows those people. So, you know, you will know someone or be a person yourself who is impacted by breast cancer because it is so prevalent in our society. So I, like I said, I went in for a, just a routine mammogram. I expected nothing to be wrong. I didn't feel any different. I was no concerns. And when I went, um, I got a call, you know, the next day to come back in. And then for any woman out there who's ever gotten that call, it is like your whole world just sinks. And so I went in and um, had a more thorough test and that determined that there was something very suspicious and then I went in for a biopsy and right then uh, the doctor came in and he, he brought someone with him. So I knew that it was gonna be bad. When they, when they bring someone in the room to break the news to you, then you know that you're in trouble. And the biopsy had detected that I had breast cancer. So. There are many things that I realized going through this situation, and one of them is that, that I'm a lot stronger than I ever thought I could be. I mean, you, you get to a point where you have to keep moving on because there is no choice but to just keep moving on. And so <clears throat> even though you know, I wouldn't want to go through the experience again, I have grown so much. I touch, I've grown so much from just the strength that I was able to find in myself and you know, to, to those people sitting out there listening, like you are so much stronger than you think that you are, and you can get through whatever you need to get through, that's for sure. So that's a really interesting thing, you know, thinking about how you carry it with you. Because I, I think about Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried and just how people do carry these, these incredible weights and challenges that they are faced with. And, and the, the, I guess the thing I would say is that you never walk alone and you never carry these things alone. Um, Having cancer is so lonely. Um, and until you actually have it, you cannot imagine just the isolation that you feel inside. And even though I was so lonely, I was never alone. Um, I, I can't believe, I'm still humbled and still in awe by the incredible support from my Niqua family, from my own family, just from the community, um, you know, Kelly Simon, freshman teacher is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to support and Mr. Rossi took off a day of work to come and sit with me through chemo. Mrs. Snyder drove through a blizzard the first day of Christmas break just to bring me a hot chocolate and sit with me for my last chemo. Like the things that people will do to step up to help you, um, I, it, it, I, I still can't believe just how lucky I am to have all these people and all this support in my life. I would say that be there just show up for people um, I had so many people who who offered to help and as a you know as the one with cancer in the beginning it was really hard to say okay you could do this for me or I would appreciate this but I think if, if you're struggling then accept the help because people want to they want to do something and so let them do something and let them know what they can do um, and as far as people on the outside who want to help, just, just be there. You know, you don't have to know what to say. Just show up and be there and let, you know, let people know that, that you do care. It's okay not to know what to say, but, but not saying anything, um, that's hard. Just, just, just be there. Yeah, I had absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Like I said, I was, I went yesterday actually for my 18 month blood draw and pulling into the cancer center, I, I still could not believe, I can't believe that I'm pulling into the cancer center even now after I've been, you know, so much time has passed. Um, I think that there weren't really any symptoms. Yeah, there was nothing. I, I didn't have any symptoms going into it, which is why having a mammogram, having, you know, if you feel like there's anything off, you, you need to get things checked out no matter, no matter what it is, simply because you know, cancer doesn't clear itself up. You know, it only gets worse. So 
it's very easy to be scared and to not want to do anything because you're scared of what the results might tell you, but it's only going to get worse. So you have to step up. And like I said earlier, like you are stronger than you know, and you can get through you know, these difficult things. So for the type of cancer I have, basically with breast cancer, there are two, there, there's a lot of different types, but there are um, two general types. One of them is hormone active and one of them is not. And so 15% of women have the kind of breast cancer that I had, which is HR negative. Um, and that means that, that starving it from hormones does not affect it. You have to go in and, and literally blast it, is how my oncologist explained it. So, you know, once I was diagnosed, the process of getting me into chemo, it went so fast. Within probably a week, I had a port put into my chest. Um, and then within two weeks, I started chemotherapy. The chemo that I had is called adriamycin. It's called the Red Devil. So my infusion nurse had to actually wear a hazmat suit in order to administer it. Um, and it is a bright red color, but it like literally kills everything in your body. And so the first, I was on chemo for four months. My last time was the day before Christmas Eve. And um, so I did chemotherapy. And then as soon as that was over in January, I, I started this in September. And then in January when I had my surgery is when I had stopped. Something that's interesting is that when I, this is kind of out of the way, but I just thought of this, like when I got the call saying that, that there was something suspicious and I was going to have to go in for the biopsy. It was literally right before I was about to walk in to my sixth hour or my fifth hour um, AP English class to introduce myself on the first day of school. So I get the call. I saw where it was from. I'm standing out in the hallway. I have to take it. And so then the woman on the other end told me that I needed to come back because there was something suspicious. And then the bell rings and I walk in. Hi, I'm Mr. Besick. And so you know, talk about being a good actress. That was something that was, uh, it was, yeah. The hardest part though about being diagnosed with breast cancer was having to tell my kids. Um, because my, my father had just passed away from a very quick and aggressive, deadly form of brain cancer. And so that was our family experience with it. And then within a year, then I'm diagnosed. And so having to sit down with my children and tell them, um, and, and telling mom that was the hardest part. Worse than going through chemotherapy was having to tell my kids. I, I think just be aware that, that people want to help you. And you know, you, you, we all have our own story and we all have our own cancer experience and, and people are gonna say things and they're gonna want to do things to help you and some of it is gonna be awesome and sometimes it's gonna be, um, you know, depending on how you feel, you're not, not gonna wanna accept that help, but, but you just have to know you're never alone in the fight. Um, there, are, there are warriors who are fighting with you in any way that they can, and people are so good, and they will take care of you, and you just have to, you have to let them. Sure, so, you know, some of the things that I take away from this. So when I was first diagnosed, it was, it was terrible. Like, it was just, I felt my whole world just was falling apart and you know there's that phrase everything happens for a reason and I hate that phrase because of course everything happens for a reason you know um, but in hindsight when I look back at my experience number one I'm glad it happened to me um, as opposed to any other woman my daughter my mom anybody I work with I'm glad it happened to me because I can handle it um, and it has made me such a better person coming out of this on the other side. Um, you know, as a teacher, I've been teaching for almost 30 years, and I, I feel like I can empathize with pretty much every experience that my students are facing, but, but having cancer is very different from knowing someone who's had it, and it, it gave me this, this, I don't want to say edge, but it just gave me this whole new perspective to connect with students in a way that I never thought you know, that I never thought possible. And connect with their parents who have, you know, I share my story on curriculum nights and I always, every year since, and I've only been two, but, but I will have moms come up to me afterwards and, and share their stories with me. And so it's just, you know, everything does happen for a reason. And, and I, I think we say that because you want to find something good that comes out of something bad. Otherwise the bad wins. 
but being stronger and being able to connect better with people and and being able to just feel this this sense of awe and humility for just the, the goodness of humanity like that really is something I never would have known unless I went through this experience. Now, I, I don't want to go through it again, <laughs> but but it is something that um, you know that I, I'm glad to I'm glad to have put past me now. I found out my sister had cancer when we were going um, out for the holiday and we were going to go shopping and she got a phone call while we were in the car and said she needed to take it and it was the doctor telling her that her tests had come back and that she definitely had cancer and she had not told me yet and so this was the first time that I had heard about it. Um, she felt a lump and she went to the doctor right away um, and they diagnosed um, after two mammograms. My sister went through a lot of treatments. She was diagnosed in 2017 and uh, the tumor was graded at a 3A, so it had already gone into her lymph nodes. So at that point um, she had uh, chemotherapy. Actually I think they did the radiation first to shrink the tumor and then they did the chemotherapy afterwards. Um, the first time she went through in 2017, they thought they had a full, um, they thought they, that she was fully eradicated from cancer. And she had one full year where she was free from cancer and did not have to have chemotherapy. After that, um, the cancer came back in 2019 and it was in her lungs. Um, she knew something was going on. She couldn't breathe as well as she thought she could. She was a singer. She was getting ready for her son's wedding. She was planning to sing at the wedding. Um, she was having difficulty with, with breathing, um, but she was afraid to go and find out what was going on. Um, so right about, uh, actually like three days before the wedding, she went and they found that she had cancer in her lungs and that she had fluid that was um, surrounding her lungs and putting pressure on them. Um, so they drained the fluid so that she could um, sing. So she did sing at the wedding. Um, and as soon as the wedding was over, she pretty much collapsed um, from the exhaustion and was in the hospital for two weeks. Um, and then she was in the hospital again for another two weeks. So I think that summer, at the summer of, 20, of 2019, she was in the hospital for a full month. Um, and it was, you know, she had a lot of um, pulmonary issues from, you know, the, from the cancer that were, and it was creating all kinds of um, fluid in her lungs. It was the breast cancer that spread. So once, so they do tests to see um, what type of cancer it is, but it typically is the same. Um, but it can spread to other places. And so when it does spread to other places, they still call it breast cancer. Um, the, the whole treatment process, it was kind of surreal because, um, you know, you're, I was praying and hoping and trying to do everything I could to keep her spirits up, um, trying to be the tough warrior, um, trying to help her fight. Um, but at, at, at some point, you know, you realize that sometimes the, the strongest thing you can do is to let someone go. Um, so she had battled the lung issue in 2019. She was doing chemotherapy every three weeks um, for the rest of her life, is what they told her. Um, she had to give up her law practice um, every three weeks she had chemotherapy and for one week she would be completely sick and not able to really get off the couch. She felt ill, you know, had a lot of re side effects. Um, so she had two good weeks basically every three. Um, so it, it, you know, and this then became um, during COVID 
So then, you know, it was even harder because we were afraid to get her sick. Um, so I didn't get to see her as much. Um, but I went over to her house every Tuesday um, and I would make dinner for her family and for her and um, kind of celebrate with her. And then Wednesday she would go in for her treatment and then I wouldn't see her again until the next, <laughs> the next time, you know, three weeks later, basically. Um, that, you know, um, so she continued on chemo treatment. Um, she, every three weeks until 2021. In 2021, she started to have seizures and uh, they found that the cancer had gone to her brain. So in August of 2021, she started, um, she had 10 days of radiation and uh, the radiation was, um, was extreme. She, um, it, it was really hard on her body and um, it was almost, um, I would say it, you know, that was almost not just, it didn't, she was, she was very strong, but um, she was in the hospital because of the side effects from the, from the radiation. Um, so she had the radiation in August um, and that didn't seem to do too much. So by December she had, you know, suffered more, se another, se another seizure that was pretty severe uh, and they found that the tumors were growing even larger. Um, so she continued to, you know, to fight it, um, but eventually um, did, did succumb in March. Um, so in March of 2022, she stopped treatment because she was continuing, she started to have more seizures. Uh, the tumors were growing and um, she was no longer able to use her legs. Um, and we just, um, it was just, it was a lot like torture to, to say, you know, that she would go through anything more. So she, um, she did not want to make that decision. Her husband didn't want to make that decision. You know, we're always looking for, you know, what else can we do? What else can we do? Um, but the doctors agreed that, you know, to do anything else would just to, just to prolong, you know, just to prolong her agony, would prolong her agony that, that the outcome was not going to be favorable. Um, I think, I think it's important to understand that, you know, if the cancer is found at an early stage, it, it is treatable. Um, but once the cancer is, you know, um, when it mis once it mis metastasizes, that, um, it, you know, the chances are that it is not, not going to go away. Um, and so when people ask, you know, if you know there's an end to the to the treatments, um, there's there's not. So you know, try to. I, I don't know. I'm I, I'm not sure how I gotta get this message straight. Um, what's the message that I want? Is so I there's there's this. I think there's this conception. There's misconception that you know people wearing pink are fighting cancer. You know and and it can be won. There comes a point when it can't be, um, no matter how hard you fight. Um, once it met metastasizes, um, you know, it's just a matter of time. You know, you can have a, a lot of quality to your life. Um, but it's going to be limited. You know, your life is definitely limited. I think um, it's important for people to, you know, to do the self-checks, but I think it's important for everybody to know that, you know, a person, especially with breast cancer, um, once it's been initially diagnosed, you know, there, sometimes people get a lot of support, but that support needs to continue because sometimes people have treatment for the rest of their lives and it can really affect the quality of their life. Um, and so, 
um, I felt I felt like I was walking alongside my sister, um, and we walked together for five years. And um, I think when you walk with somebody, you know, a piece of you definitely dies, um, and then a part of you is, you know, kind of having that survivor's guilt maybe, where you feel like you need to take um, take stock of what you do have and appreciate it more and try to live your life more fully, um, kind of even on behalf of that person who no longer is able to. Um, I, think, I, think people, I think people need to remember that everybody reacts differently to interventions. So, you know, one person might have a better time with chemotherapy than another person. So each person is going to react differently, and sometimes the chemotherapy is, is, you know, the chemotherapy, the radiation, all of these treatments are really, you know, just really hard on the body. And um, you just never know what, what side effects will come from it. So um, appreciate, you know, the time that you have with your loved ones. Um, it, and be, you know, gracious to them. A lot of times they look on the outside like, you know, kind of normal, but on the inside they're confused or tired or, you know, anxious and you, so you just never know. So try to be, just try to be, you know, gentle and kind and... So my sister was, um, my sister was a light to uh, many people, and to me especially, I felt that I, miss I lost my best friend. Um, but we did the best that we could. We tried um, to fight and have a sense of humor. My sister would do lots of blogs where she was the warrior queen, and she was fighting against the dragon or the hydra, and um, that was kind of the theme of, of the conversation, so we didn't really talk about you know, cancer and say the word cancer. We kind of played with it um, and, you know, imagined um, the kingdom with, with the dragon being slain. And uh, it was a lot of fun doing that. And it was also, I think, a good coping mechanism to kind of get, get out of, get out of the, the serious drama of the situation and to kind of lighten it up by using um, you know, the theatrical guise of, you know, role-playing. And so I would encourage people to, you know, try to find a sense of humor, um, try to journal about it in a way that helps them, you know, release um, some of their feelings and maybe use fictional characters to help with that. Um, <clears throat> So my sister was four and a half years older than me, and um, she passed just before she reached her 60th birthday. So that was a very sad moment. Um, she was a lawyer. She always advocated for um, the underdog. Um, that's kind of a family trait. <laughs> we, um, she was um, a guardian ad litem. She represented children who, um, you know, were um, going through rough situations in their life and did not have um, adults that could take care of them appropriately. Um, she was a good person. She adopted lots of dogs. She was a dog lover. Um, she always talked about her, her, her fur babies. Um, she had three children. Um, she was very generous could always call her and talk to her and get advice. Um, she was really a good person. Yeah. So I miss her. I miss her a lot. And she was very, she was very fun. She had a lot of uh, dramatic um, interests. She loved role playing. She loved going to the uh, Renaissance Festival, dressing up for that. Um, yeah, she was, she was an excellent cook. She always made really wonderful things. I was always the one who cleaned up the kitchen. <laughs> she would cook. <laughs> so I had my role. 
my role was to clean, she was the cook. So.